what is the connection between the First Amendment and the Declaration and the Constitution? The connection is freedom of conscience, as the judge said, which the founders considered first among the unalienable rights that were enshrined in the preamble to the Declaration, and first among the blessings of liberty that were enshrined in the preamble to the Constitution. Now, how do we know that the rights of conscience, as the founders called them, were first among the unalienable rights and first among the blessings of liberty? We know that from two sacred texts that I want to talk to you about now as we dedicate the First Amendment tablet. And those texts are Thomas Jefferson's Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom in Virginia, which he drafted in 1777, and Justice Brandeis's opinion in Whitney versus California, which he drafted in 1927. So Jefferson drafted his Virginia bill months after he returned to Philadelphia after drafting the Declaration. He considered the Religious Freedom Bill among the three accomplishments of his life significant enough to be inscribed on his tombstone, along with his having drafted the Declaration and founded the University of Virginia. Under Virginia's colonial religious code at the time, all dissenters were required to support and attend the established Anglican Church. Presbyterians and Baptists could be arrested for practicing their faith or preaching the gospel. Quakers and Jews and other dissenters could be denied the freedom to marry or have custody of their children. Jefferson proposed not only to disestablish the Anglican Church and remove all criminal punishments for dissent, but also to prohibit all compelled support for religion of any kind. He concluded that because freedom of conscience is a fundamental right, government can regulate overt acts against peace and order, but it lacks all power to intrude into the field of opinion. And Jefferson's bill set out four reasons why government can make no law that constrains our freedom of speech, conscience, of opinion. I learned after reading Jefferson and reading Brandeis that those four reasons that Jefferson identified were summed up by Justice Brandeis in the Whitney case because he'd read Jefferson's draft bill in the summer of 1926 before writing Whitney in 1927. And these four reasons are the four principal reasons that the Supreme Court has developed since then for why free speech matters. And here are the four reasons that are in Jefferson's bill and in Brandeis's opinion. One, freedom of conscience is an unalienable right because people can only think for themselves. Two, free speech makes representatives accountable to we the people. Three, free speech is necessary for the discovery of truth and rejection of falsehood. And four, free speech allows the public discussion necessary for democratic self-government. So let's review each of Jefferson's four reasons. And it's just remarkable. They're right there. It's a short document. And he lays them all out with exquisite clarity. One, freedom of conscience is an unalienable right. Here are Jefferson's words in the first sentence of his draft. Well aware that the opinions and beliefs of men depend not on their own will, but follow involuntarily the evidence proposed to their minds, Jefferson wrote, God hath created the mind free and manifested his supreme will that free it shall remain by making it altogether insusceptible of restraint. In other words, Jefferson is arguing that freedom of conscience is by definition an unalienable right a right that we can't alienate or surrender or give up to government because our opinions are the involuntary result of the evidence contemplated by our reasoning minds. We can't give presidents or priests or teachers or fellow citizens the power to think for us even if we wanted to because we're endowed as human beings by our creator with the capacity to reason and therefore, we can't help thinking for ourselves. Now, we know that Madison, the drafter of the First Amendment, shared Jefferson's views on this point because he echoed them exactly. 
in his memorial and remonstrance against religious assessments in 1785, which was what persuaded the Virginia legislature to pass Jefferson's bill. And this is Madison's language. He's saying the same thing in slightly fewer words. The rights of conscience are unalienable, Madison wrote, because the opinions of men, depending only on the evidence contemplated by their own minds, cannot follow the dictates of other men. Reason two, free speech makes representatives accountable to we the people. In his Religious Freedom Bill, Jefferson emphasized that it's crucial in a democracy for citizens to be able to criticize public officials because legislators and religious leaders, being themselves fallible and uninspired, as Jefferson put it, will always try to impose their opinions and modes of thinking on others. And Jefferson's prediction came true in the controversy over the Alien and Sedition Act of 1798, where the Federalist Congress made it a crime to criticize the Federalist president, John Adams, but not the Republican vice president, Thomas Jefferson. And Madison once again echoed Jefferson's views, so we know that as the drafter of the First Amendment, he agreed with them, in his Virginia resolution criticizing the Sedition Act, which said that the Sedition Act, quote, ought to produce universal alarm because it is leveled against that right of freely examining public char characters and measures, which Madison said is the only effectual guardian of every other right. Three, free speech is necessary for the discovery and spread of political truth. Jefferson concludes his religious freedom bill with words expressing his unshakable faith in the power of reason deliberation to distinguish truth from error, in words that are inscribed in marble on the Jefferson Memorial in Washington. Truth is great, Jefferson said, and will prevail if left to herself. She is the proper and sufficient antagonist to error and has nothing to fear from the conflict unless by human interposition, disarmed of her natural weapons, free argument and debate. Reason four, free speech allows the public discussion necessary for democratic self-government. Jefferson believed that in a democracy, all citizens have an equal right and responsibility to exercise their rights of conscience. As he put it in his Virginia bill, proscribing any citizen as unworthy the public confidence by layering upon him an incapacity of being called to offices of trust unless he profess or renounce this or that religious opinion is depriving him injuriously of those privileges and advantages to which in common with his fellow citizens, he has a natural right. Now, on the Supreme Court, in the greatest free speech opinion of the 20th century, Justice Louis Brandeis distilled Jefferson's four reasons for protecting free speech into a few paragraphs of constitutional poetry. And in the Whitney case, we see the first Jewish justice insisting on the right of Anita Whitney, a white woman, to make a speech defending anti-lynching laws which were designed to protect the life and liberty of African Americans. And Whitney made her speech at a Communist Party meeting, and she was convicted under a California law that made it a crime to associate with organizations that advocated doctrines that might lead people to break the law. And Brandeis, having read Jefferson the previous summer, adopted and refined Jefferson's standard for ensuring that government could only punish overt acts of lawbreaking, not the expression of dangerous opinion. And this is the crucial test that Jefferson uh, inspired Brandeis to adopt. As Brandeis put it in Whitney, fear of serious injury cannot alone justify suppression of free speech and assembly. Men feared witches and burnt women. It is the function of free speech to free men from the bondage of irrational fears. To justify suppression of speech, there must be reasonable ground to fear that serious evil will result if the free speech is practiced. And there must be reasonable ground to believe that the danger apprehended is imminent. Brandeis's inspiring test was based on his Jeffersonian faith in the power of what he called free and fearless reasoning to expose falsehood through public discussion. If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies, 
To avert the evil by the process of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. Only an emergency can justify repression. Brandeis' test is finally adopted by the Supreme Court in the Brandenburg case in 1969, which held, as we were discussing earlier, that government can ban speech only if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent serious injury. And as a result, and as a result of these inspiring words, the US Supreme Court now protects free speech more vigorously than any other judiciary in the world. And then, Jeff, then Brandeis summarized Jefferson's four reasons um, in this crystalline paragraph. I've now done it enough times as a party trick that I think I can recite the paragraph from memory. You've met several, many of you have heard me do it, but it's important as an act of consecration at this moment to recite Brandeis's words. And now that I do it, I want you to listen closely to every word and you'll hear the four reasons that I just identified from Jefferson about why free speech is important. Conscience is an unalienable right. It is necessary for political accountability. It's necessary for the discovery and spread of political truth. And it's necessary to allow truth to vanquish error. So here's Brandeis. And now you see the importance of the place. Brandeis begins by talking not about Madison and the Constitution makers of 1787, but about Jefferson and the Declaration writers of 1776. And I'm going to inspire myself, if I may, by, as I recite this, looking not at you, but at Independence Hall with the words behind me, because this is significant. Those who won our revolution believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties, and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. That's from Pericles' funeral oration. They believed that liberty to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth that without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. You see the connection. I hadn't seen it before between the First Amendment, the Virginia Bill, the Constitution, and the Declaration. And that's why it is right and appropriate that these words are here. Now, just a few final thoughts, and then we will close. This paragraph shows that all four of Jefferson and Brandeis's reasons for protecting free speech are based on an Enlightenment faith in reason itself. The First Amendment is based on a faith that people will take time to cultivate their faculties of reason through education and public discussion of the kind of convening that we're doing now. It's based on a faith that public deliberation will check arbitrary and partisan demagogues rather than enable them, that more speech will lead to the spread of more truth rather than more falsehood, and that people will, in fact, take time for discussion and deliberation rather than making impulsive decisions based on passion rather than reason. As we all know, and as we all have been discussing, this founding faith in reason is being questioned in our polarized age of social media. Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms are being based on a business model that's now being called Enrage to Engage. They've accelerated public discourse to warp speed, creating virtual versions of the mob. Inflammatory posts based on passion travel farther and faster than arguments based on reason. And rather than encouraging deliberation, mass media at times undermines it by creating filter bubbles and echo chambers in which citizens see only those opinions they already embrace. For these reasons, some are calling for America's free speech tradition to be reconsidered or abandoned. But as you've heard from my inspiring colleagues, 
Here at the National Constitution Center, by contrast, we're proud to reaffirm the faith in reasoned deliberation by consecrating these 45 words that will shine forever in this hallowed space as a vital platform for nonpartisan constitutional education and debate, as Judge Ludig said. We bring together Americans of different perspectives to cultivate their faculties of reason. Only by listening to the best arguments on all sides of the constitutional questions at the center of American life can all of us exercise our right and duty to make up our own minds. And so, like Jefferson and Brandeis, like Frederick Douglass and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, like all of the great free speech heroes of American history, and like Jen Neurath and Judge Michael Ludig, we are dedicated to preserving, protecting, and defending what Jefferson called the illimitable freedom of the human mind. And now, let me consecrate this tablet by expressing this hope. May the shining words of the First Amendment tablet inspire future generations with this self-evident truth. Reason will always combat error as long as individuals are free to follow the dictates of conscience wherever it boldly leads. On behalf of all of us at the National Constitution Center, thank you again, Jen Neurath, Judge Ludig, all my superb colleagues who made this spectacular, meaningful, and permanent installation possible. Thank you for this gift to the American people, and thanks all of you for joining us.